Historian Andrei Zubov is with us today. Hello, Andrei. Hello, I'm very happy to see you. This is mutual. And I would like to start with the news. It is quite strange and quite loud, and from the political point of view, it's quite interesting. Uh, Margarita Simonian, uh, one of the main Russian propagandists, uh, the editor in chief of uh, Russia Today, uh, she made a statement that it would be great to explode a thermonuclear charge over Siberia, and uh, it's not going to be bad for the world, and uh, all electronics will just uh, shut off. And Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, the head of the Chechen Republic, said that Simonian is a smart woman, and if she comes up with something like that, it comes from the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. And what do you think it was? Uh, do, do we need to pay uh, serious attention to this? Uh, and since uh, many journalists do that. No, I don't think we should notice it at all. And the same goes for Medvedev's statements and the statements of uh, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. It is horrible what's going on in Russia today. But what they do, this is just an idle talk, baloney. Uh, it is aggressive, looks quite tough, but in reality nothing will follow it. They're not going to explode anything over Siberia, they're not going to take over another half of Ukraine, as Medvedev says. They actually don't know how to get out of this conflict. See, for some reason, uh, the Russian pro-authority media, they create this atmosphere of aggressive insanity. I don't know why they do that. It seems like uh, in the street fight, uh, somebody screams that, don't touch me, I'm crazy. I think this is something like that. And obviously the global community will gradually make Russia follow all the principles that the international community is based on, those principles that Russia so irresponsibly and bloodily broke. In this nuclear rhetoric, there are several layers. There is like Simonian and Medvedev that have this aggressive point of view. But it seems there are uh, other people who have a more academic approach. It's Karaganov, Trenin and Lukyanov. And uh, they kind of methodologically push this topic too, and they're trying to instill uh, this idea into the Western community. Do you think there is a message there for the Western countries? I think that you put it right, that the language uh, they use is different. And in my old life, uh, I know very well Lukyanov, Trin, Karaganov, and I used to speak at the Council of uh, Foreign and uh, Defense Policy, but it was before 2014, and I took part in Valdai Forum, and the last time I did it in September, uh, of 2013, and I can assure you that yet they use a different language, and uh, but it's an irresponsible chatter. It's just idle talk, and it's a pity that Karaganov, Lukyanov used to be smart people, and they kind of degraded to such a level. And it's another proof that when somebody tries to defend something that is that does not deserve to be defended and uh, participate in propaganda, such people degrade, and this is what we witness. There is no any message, there won't be any nuclear war, it's just the same exact story, it's kind of don't touch me, I'll kill you. Usually those say that who will never hit back, uh, those who actually have the strength to hit, they're usually silent and when it's needed they hit, but those who are weak and can't do anything, they usually scare people, intimidate people like this, uh, counting on psychological effect of it. About the degradation, it's very interesting to witness 
uh, how quickly, uh, quickly this degradation goes uh, with the uh, kind of smart people, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the head of the Russian Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, with his position and with the rhetoric and his uh, uh, reputation in the international arena, so he's like this now. And Fedor Lukyanov, who used to come to our streams, and uh, he was never uh, like a, a shallow person. Person. But it was very interesting to dis discuss things with him, with them, with him. And uh, so, what do you think? Uh, the speed of degradation, what it depends on? I think uh, that uh, we touch on the area of collective unconscious that Carl Jung studied. When a person joins this field of evil, uh, like uh, Lukyanov, Karaganov, and Lavrov, when they defend this field of aggression and lie, something that cannot be defended at all, for no normal person to defend something like this and defend actions of Russia today, it's just impossible. A normal person can only think about one thing uh, if he thinks about Russia, how Russia can actually get out of it uh, with uh, as little losses as possible. But when people say they're going to continue, like Shoigu, the Ministry of Defense of Russia says that uh, they kind of tinkered uh, another big rocket or missile or something. Uh, this is not smart. Smart people who are trying to defend uh, false ideas and uh, destructive ideas and steps, they inevitably get on the track of degradation. This is how it happens. This collective unconscious possesses a smart person and makes a smart person not smart anymore. In Soviet time, there was a great poet, Konstantin Simonov, and he tried to justify Stalin's regime. He was serving this regime, and then he served Khrushchev, and as a result, degraded. And I think he was not the only one. Alexei Tolstoy, the same thing, a great writer, talented writer, and as soon as he started serving this devil, KGB, and he became what he became. And that's just a general trend. Everybody who is taking care of their soul should avoid such selling of themselves. In the medieval age, they used to say, selling yourself to a devil, and it's always uh, quite sad to see that. What happens to such people, uh, such a great thinker as Goethe in his Faust poem, and uh, genius, sometimes he writes uh, beautiful things and uh, genius things, and sometimes they don't even understand what they actually wrote, how genius it is. He showed in his poem how his uh, hero Faust degrades after uh, he signs this uh, agreement with uh, Mephistopheles. He gets a woman who loves him, he gets what he wants, and he gets the respect of the emperor of the uh, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And then in the second half of Faust, he completely degrades. This is an example of uh, how people shouldn't do. But who in this uh, situation is uh, Volant, Devil, or Mephistopheles, uh, if we use the most popular names? Is it Putin? Or Putin is uh, the person who signed this contract with Mephistopheles? I'll see Volant, Mephistopheles, uh, they're devils. Mephistopheles, Toffee, is devil in German. Yes. 
yes, that's a that's evil spirit. For non-believer, this is this genius of evil that is in the air. For believers, it's an antagonist of God, evil spirit. Putin uh, was a little boy. He suffered. He had his psychological issues. Uh, he lived in a troubled family, and to some degree you feel sorry for him, but yes, as a result, he made this contract, this horrible contract, and from this little suffering boy, he turned into a, this horrible man uh, who destroys and corrupts whole society, not only Russia, and uh, we shouldn't forget that sympathizers of Putin are all over the world, and uh, even in the most civilized countries. See, evil in itself is powerless. Evil is evil. It's just an idea. There should be somebody who will be implementing it in life. But if there is no one who would be implementing it, then it's just going to be an abstract idea. And they will be just discussing this, uh, like uh, we are here when we're discussing it here, what evil is. But if evil is taking shape and is done through a person, uh, then the person becomes an inductor of uh, the active evil. And uh, Putin started taking this evil in huge dosages, and he became this inductor of horrible evil. And all those who followed his will, doing it consciously to build a career and to make their position stronger in the government. So they're following this same path. In fact, every one of us, whether we're small or a big person, whether you watch TV or every day you shake Putin's hand, all these people make a decision every day, whether they're going to be an inductor uh, of evil or not. And that's going to be a crucial decision uh, for Karaganov Simonyan, who used to be a good journalist, at some point. So I think they're just general things. This competition of ideas, let me turn uh, turn it into a modern language, it's kind of marketing part here, good and evil, whom to join, what ideology to choose. So how this marketing thing works, kind of join us, we are strong, we are great, we have a bomb, we can destroy everybody. I know that for some people it's quite tempting uh, from the point of view of scale of it. We have it, we can do it. Do you think there is this marketing element here? Yes, of course. Yes, there is this marketing element in uh, Mephistopheles offer to Faust. Of course, he's offered everything. I think there was this great song when Satan seduces a person and says that you'll have everything, you'll have women, money, everything. Yes, of course, you'll have pay for it, but it's going to be later. But right now, you'll get everything. And I think, in fact, this is how it happens. And those who received everything, and they know that this everything is nothing, so all these bonuses that Satan or evil gives them, it's nothing. And there is Italian saying that everything the devil gives you turns into dust. It seems that you're going to get everything, but you don't get anything, you don't get even iota of happiness, all your money, cars, power, women, they get it to be happy, but you don't get even an iota of happiness. Everything, all these gifts of Satan that we get, they empty you and make you unhappy and drive you to the brink of suicide. Satan needs you to kill other people destroying the image of God and as a result killing yourself. Hitler went this path completely 
and he pushes everybody the same direction who everybody who gets on this path well satan gives you a choice and if you look at bulgakov's voland and we know this is a literary work it's a noble uh, but there is some sort of noble message there uh, there is noble intention and they can test the person and they want to see where the person was going to go there's like an element of justice it's kind of they're trying to test you and see are you with me or not and letting people express themselves so it doesn't look like absolute evil that wants to control everything and i think in even in Boland, there is this kind of sad message he doesn't impress you as a character of like infernal evil it's not like that it's sort of deeper and there are more colors to it I think, let's call him Voland, and uh, he doesn't give you a freedom of choice. A freedom of choice is a necessary rule of the game, but the game was composed by the creator. God created man free. That's why there is no any evil power that can take over a person without a person's consent. We know many people who are believers and non-believers who refuse to cooperate with evil, even if their life was threatened and they had to pay for it with their lives. And they came out as victors. In Christianity, they call them martyrs. They came out as victors from this battle and seemed they died like Christ, uh, but they won over the evil, defeated the evil, not submitting to it. That's why Voland can offer anything. Of course, a uh, person can refuse this when Voland offers this. But at some point, evil begins to prompt the person. So you made the choice. There is no way back. So you died for it. For, so now continue following my will. And this is Karaganov and Lukyanov think. But I have to tell those people that they are mistaken. At any point in your life, while you are alive, you have freedom of choice, you have freedom of will, and it's very hard to break uh, out of these chains and it's going to be through more sufferings but if you want you can break out of this uh, chains and you can say no Lavrov can say no at any point and Karaganov and Lukyanov and even Simonian for, for that matter but sadly they keep saying yes to evil and they keep uh, telling these fairy tales about this uh, nuclear explosion in Siberia so but they still fall in the track so it seems that with every next step with every Every next word that Semenyan, Solovyov, Medvedev and others say, they become more unhappy people if we follow your logic. They become more dependent on evil, but, but they never become dependent on evil totally. And while they're alive, there is always a chance to become different. Even for Putin, uh, there is a possibility to uh, break free. Uh, and this is not a suicide. Uh, this is a public admission of their guilt and mistakes and public repentance and public publicly stopping making this horrible action and it seems uh, absolutely impossible how Hitler and Putin can do that uh, I can't really give you examples right now but there are such examples a person always have a freedom of choice in your view is it possible to outplay evil without going straight but kind of going indirect kind of sit through it, kind of cynically. You're sort of playing the game, but somewhere you understand when the situation settles down, you will be able to get away with it. So, or you can't really outplay Voland or Devil. Well, I have to tell you like this. If you begin to play, you will lose, and you will lose to Voland. You cannot play ever spiritual life and what spiritual life is this is how you relate to spirits of evil and spirits of good and this is what your spiritual life this material life when you eat drink you love your wife 
and the spiritual life when you make spiritual choices and this is not a game this is the most serious thing that you have in your life this is the essence of your being all your future all your eternity for those who believe in eternity of a human being all that has to do with your choices that's why you're not playing with volant or devil you tell him directly no right from the start and you understand that for this no you may suffer but you know that you're on the side of good and the good is stronger than volant infinitely stronger than volant and the good will allow the sufferings for you uh, only to make them useful for you and to become stronger uh, this good will always defend you I live my life like this I'm in my 70s now and I never felt that I made a wrong choice this choice is always with me, and I recommend all our viewers, if they haven't watched uh, uh, this American film that's called Judgment at Nuremberg, uh, it's a movie of 1961. I really don't like watching movies, and uh, getting older I see that movies usually uh, this is the implementation of weaknesses of a director. They, they show something they, can, they can't master in their life, so they portray it in the movies. But there are really great films uh, where you can uh, find a certain message. Message is a kind of buzzword today. Uh, and Judgment at Nuremberg uh, is this kind of film. A whole number of uh, German lawyers who were promoting Hitler's policy and many people died. All those lawyers were brought to court. And one of them, probably the most talented lawyer, he realized his guilt and he publicly admitted it at the trial. And it's true, there was uh, such a case. It's not a fiction. And then other lawyers who were kind of one rank lawyer, they, beca they began to blame him and accuse him, calling him a traitor. But before that, they were submitting to him. Interestingly enough, they also showed kind of the other side. This is when the judge who was taking part in the proceedings, American judge, was pressured by the office of the military government of the US in Germany. They were trying to make him finish the proceedings faster and making him be not so harsh on the Germans. So they were saying that we need Germany not as a defeated enemy, but as an ally. And in this sense, it's quite a strong pressing. And it's a very strong film in this view. Some senator comes from the US and some general from the office talks to the senator, but the judge stays his course. And uh, he does it as his conscience tells him. And this is what should be done. That's why I recommend all of you to watch this film, this black and white film, and I think it will inspire you. And I would recommend Lukyanov and Lavrov to watch this film too. What about the Russian Orthodox Church as an institution? It is supposed to submit to one being, not human being. Uh, and we see how the Church is merging with the powers. It's now it's one of the departments of the administration of the President of Russia. So what happened to this uh, Church element in Russia? And why those... Uh, the top priests, uh, they don't have anything to protect themselves with and when to Mephistopheles to surrender. Well, it's a long story and it goes beyond Putin's regime and beyond uh, the century of Soviet power. The thing is that the Russian Orthodox Church, at a certain point, and that happened long ago. The church began to serve the temporal power. 
and it stopped serving Jesus Christ. Of course, it was not across the board, but those who still served Christ, they became martyrs, like Metropolitan Philip, uh, who was tortured to death by Maluta Skrat of the head of the secret police of Ivan the Terrible. Though the majority of priests, they preferred this kind of easy way to serve the temporal power, receiving many benefits and privileges. In the Imperial Russia, uh, archbishops uh, of such metropolis as uh, St. Petersburg, Moscow and Kiev, they had huge funds, they lived in great comfort. And naturally, for an average person, it was okay. And not even for an average person, even as such saints, so like metropolitan, uh, Filaret uh, was okay with this too. Uh, he wasn't serving evil kind of openly like others, but he was silent when in church they committed evil during Nicholas the second time. He was afraid to say anything. He was silent, but some people uh, were open about it. So it's kind of a long talk. When Bolsheviks took over the power, the church was still loyal to the old regime kind of by default. Some priests were loyal to Christ, but most of them were loyal to the old regime and only facing martyrdom and facing the shooting squad. Many priests, they realized who is, who, who is their real master, whom they should give their soul away to. And I think uh, many of them became martyrs for faith. And, but those who didn't, they were still serving uh, the power, whether it's atheistic communist power. And you know that in September of 1943, Stalin called uh, the last three metropolitans, uh, metropolitan, metropolitan Sergei Nikolai Dershevich, and Alexei Isimansky, those metropolitans were called by Stalin and he said to them what should he do so that uh, the church would serve the Russian people as it was before and they told him bring back patriarchy and give us the power and Stalin gave them the power and clearly how what the power he gave them say from from whose hands and if before 1943 uh, the church as a whole was serving either the old regime the regime that died or, or God, then after that, the leadership of the church started serving atheist communist state and merged with KGB. Alexei the first, Zemansky, he used to say that if at the beginning of his patriarchy, and his patriarchy began in 1943, and he used to appoint uh, nine archbishops and out of the ten, and one was appointed by KGB, and now it is 1960s, he was appointing uh, one of them, and nine were appointed by KGB. But in, in many ways, he was in the hands of KGB too. So those appointees that he brought were not clean enough. Either. So today, the church is taken over by this horrible regime, and no less than Putin, Lavrov, and others, and they say even more horrible things, because when a lieutenant colonel says these things, awful things, they are not as horrible as if it is said by patriarch. And of course, there are archbishops and uh, priests, they are still serving God and uh, saying, telling the truth and we know how many of them suffer in Russia and even abroad and many of them are accused by the patriarch of Russia but that service is continues there are many people who see that it's better to suffer than to sell their soul to the devil. I have this analogy, it just came to my mind. Let me express it. I'm curious how you comment on this. The Soviet regime crushed the Prague Spring, and in Moscow, seven people came out to protest, and they became a symbol of this protest. And not all, all Russian people are bad, and Václav Gavel, the last president of Czechoslovakia, said that. And we look at Russian Orthodox Church, and we know Andrei Kuraev, deacon, uh, who was under the ban, and he still in Russia, and he keeps saying, keep telling the truth. And there are many priests 
countries like that that come to us to our streams and they do risk and they say certain things and serious consequences may follow so these people who are not afraid and using this analogy do they show do they demonstrate they're not all people in church in the church are bad maybe it's not a martyr they're not martyrs but they go against the stream in church they call it conf they call them confessors uh, and in greek both words it kind of sound the same martyrs confessors but yes Boris Pasternak just let's kind of lower this path a little bit and uh, in Boris Pasternak's poem Mary Stewart uh, there, is, there are such words about one old ballet fan and womanizer and the line goes like this he's divorced for the third time his hair turned gray and he's the only one who justified the lies of uh, of women of that time. Maybe that guy from the poem, he justified the lives of uh, the women of his time, but the lives of the Russian church today are justified by the people who stand for truth, even if they are oppressed for this. Because right now, uh, this moment, this time, is an, is an incredible time. No truth and no truth is kind of not relative anymore. In the 90s and the 2000s, we couldn't tell right away if it's truth or not. Politically, something was likable or not, but for today, a spiritually sensitive person, it's clear that this unmotivated war that Putin sent uh, Russians to die in and to kill Ukrainians, of course, it's absolute evil. There is no one iota of good, it's pure evil. There were some issues between Russians and Ukrainians, of course, like between any nations, but they should have been resolved on diplomatic level in some international venues like OSCE and others, and everything is possible to be settled. And if Ukraine didn't want to settle on something uh, that the, the rest of the world would consider uh, legitimate, uh, then then Ukraine would be in a very vulnerable position. But instead of this, Putin moved his troops to conquer the country, to conquer the people, and couldn't do it. And it's obvious evil. Nobody will deny it. And there's no single person that say that Holocaust, that Nazis did, that is good. Of course, it's 100% evil. Right now, it is such a time when we have this 100% evil. And it doesn't mean that the other side is 100% good. The opposite side is like any other side, uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages, pluses, minuses, light and dark. And this refined evil, Mephistopheles evil, if you support it, you take the evil side totally. And we started our conversation why such people like Karaganov, Lukyanov and Simonians behave so strangely. They behave so strangely because they took the evil side, 100% evil, uh, due to different reasons, some for money, some for fame, some for some erroneous expectations of their careers, what not. So in this absolute darkness, if we use this image, so such flashes like Kuraev's words, prescribed words, or imprisonment of Navalny or Ilya Yashin imprisonment. In other words, there is potential to break through this absolute darkness with uh, uh, this, say, flashlights or torches. Let me tell you this. Yesterday, Vladimir Karamurza posted a message from Omsky prison. 
where he is now. And I commented on it in Facebook. I don't know who did it for him, maybe one of his friends. But in any way, I felt that I should uh, comment on this. And I wrote that I'm now abroad, I'm in Czech Republic now, and I feel weak. Uh, yes, I didn't take the evil part, uh, but I was afraid of taking the hit. Being on the good side, I kind of evaded the hit. And I feel ashamed, and I could find many excuses, but I don't want to find excuses, I just want to call things as they are. But Navalny and uh, Vladimir Karamurza, they came to Russia absolutely knowing what's going to happen. Obviously not laurel wreaths but balls and chains, and in this sense they have become symbols of invincibility of the good, and this is a very important position. It doesn't mean that Navalny or Karamurza will be a good president. It doesn't mean that. Because a person in one position, uh, they're perfect, and in the other, they're not. There are many examples like that. But right now, they proved by their actions the strengths of courage and the strengths of truth. And I know both of them, and I know they're all believers, they're Christians. And their position is not kind of a position of a random resistance. No, it's a conscious Christian position to go all the way to the truth, where they can choose different. And that's a very precise position. And actually helps us to see the darkness of the evil and see all the grotesqueness of the behavior of such people like Simonian, Lavrov, Putin, Lukyanov. And we can see it in the light of their courage and resilience. Another comment I would like to make. What about these closed eyes? Of course, if you live all the time in the darkness and your optic nerve atrophied and you can't see well. But there is a feeling uh, that their eyes are just closed and uh, people's eyelids are glued and people just can't open their eyes. I would like to use some kind of noble image Images. But let's say this, who is going to splash the glue remover so that kind of with burns and stuff, but people may open their eyes and could look at the truth. So do you have a feeling that somebody is going to splash this glue remover? Or maybe not a glue remover, maybe something else. Well, the image that you come up with uh, is horrifying. Of course, to splash acid in the face, that's just awful. Let's just, you know, take away this image. No, I didn't mean the uh, sulfuric acid, and it, it's not something that will destroy someone. No. See, in the beginning of our talk, we said there is a free will of a human being. While a person is alive, they always have a free will. And if the person close their eyes or even blindfold them themselves or uh, use the scotch tape, people do it on their own. Nobody did it to them. And it's always like this. In the Soviet time, when there was no internet, we, young people, despite all the radio dampers, we listened to the Voice of America, to BBC. I remember this commentator, uh, uh, Golubev, uh, passed away now. He was bringing us truth. We were uh, driving away from the cities uh, in the countryside uh, with the radio sets, and we were listening to where there were no dampers, and we would go camping 
coming in, we would bring radio sets with us. So we wanted to know. If the person doesn't want to know the truth, they don't want to know the truth. And now I learn again and time again when I talk to my friends in Russia, they just directly tell me, let's not talk about it. And actually, when you begin to talk about the war in Ukraine, about the crimes of the regime, about these horrible sentences that the Russian pseudo court issues for the people who speak the truth and those imprisonments uh, for those who defend the truth. And people I talk to, they they take it as if I'm talking about something inappropriate. Because in Russia, people prefer not to talk about it. They kind of say, you kind of, we live our life, we do our studies, uh, we repair our stuff, we do things as usual, and we don't want to know or listen to something. And, it exists. and everybody knows it exists, nobody can forget about it. That's why the person has to open their eyes on their own, they have to unglue the scotch tape on their own. When they open eyes, they have to look at what's going on and to assess, to assess it with their conscience. And then there will be an effect. And every single one of us has to do that. Because an alternative is very simple. In this film, Judgment at Nuremberg, average Germans were saying, we didn't know that, we didn't know about Holocaust. We didn't know that the regime castrates its opponents, saying that they're insane. So we didn't know that. But they did. They did know it. Or they could know it. They could know it. They could easily learn about it. Uh, there were these train cars with Jewish children, uh, those train cars that were sent to uh, Auschwitz. And Germans knew that they heard those cries of the children, but they plugged their ears. And we, in Russia, we plugged our ears. And we close our eyes. And then, later, we will be greatly accused, because you need to hear and you need to make conclusions from what you hear and from what you see. Thank you very much for being with us today on our stream, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you very much.